Welcome everyone to GeoNight 2023. This event is sponsored by Canadian Geographic Education, the Education Committee of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. My name is Paul Van Zandt, the Chair of CanGeo Education and your host for tonight's presentation, Our Restless Earth, Going to Extremes with George Karunas. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging that my work, the work of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and that of the Canadian Ge Geographic Education staff takes place on the traditional territory and ancestral lands of the Iroquoian, Anishinaabe, and Algonquin peoples, who have been the guardians of and in relationship with these lands for thousands of years. I further acknowledge and recognize that our collective work reaches across all the distinct First Nations, Métis homelands, and Inuit Nunungat, and for this we are grateful. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, George Karunas. George Karunas is a Toronto-based explorer, storm chaser, and TV presenter who has spent 25 years documenting extreme forces of nature and natural phenomena worldwide, including tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, floods, and the effects of climate change. He holds the titles of Explorer in Residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and National Geographic Explorer, but is probably best known to the public for having hosted the TV series Angry Planet. He also co-hosted Storm Hunters for the Weather Network and is a regular on-camera contributor for Strange Evidence and What on Earth on the Science Channel and Mysteries from Above on the Smithsonian Channel. He has appeared in programs for National Geographic, Discovery, Netflix and more, and is frequently invited to comment about global weather and natural disasters by CNN, the BBC, the CBC, and other news outlets. George also earned a Guinness World Record for being the first person to ever set foot at the bottom of the Darvaza, or Doorway to Hell, flaming gas crater in remote Turkmenistan. He has documented changes to melting permafrost in Siberia, sea level rise in Tuvalu, shifting tornado and hurricane patterns in North America, wildfires in Australia, and melting polar ice. In 2014, he was awarded the Stephenson Medal from the Explorers Club Canadian Chapter for outstanding contribution to science and to public education by documenting extreme environments through filmmaking. In 2020, he was awarded the Leif Erikson Exploration Award from the Exploration Museum in Iceland and was named one of Canada's greatest explorers by Canadian Geographic magazine. We are thrilled to have George with us today to share his experiences. Hi, George. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Paul. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the invitation to come and represent Canada today at GeoNight. It's an honor and pleasure for me. What we're going to do today is I'm going to bring you along on a tour around the world and how I document some of these most extreme forces of nature. We're going to go from hot to cold and everything in between. Shall we get started? Absolutely. Here we go. So as Paul mentioned, yes, I'm explorer in residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And years ago, I made it my life's mission to travel the world, document the most extreme places on our planet, and then share what I've seen with as many people as possible. And I do that in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm based in Toronto. And for anyone who knows Toronto, of course, we've got the CN Tower. And I sort of got my start in documenting weather by photographing the CN Tower getting struck by lightning. It gets hit between 70 to 100 times every single year. It's like the world's tallest freestanding lightning rod. And every single one of these bolts, even though it's only as thin as your finger, can be a hundred million volts of electricity and burn five times hotter than the sun. So I found that absolutely fascinating. And as I developed my interest in, in weather and photography and exploration, um, it built upon my interest in science and nature as a kid. And then as I became an adult, I, I focused it uh, in the, the world of nature, really, and the extremes of nature more specifically. And throughout my expeditions and travels over the past 25 years or so, I've been fortunate enough 
to visit about 80 different countries on all seven continents, from Antarctica to Greenland, from North Korea to Egypt, from Patagonia to uh, New Zealand and every point in between. And let me tell you, we think we live on a quiet planet where not much is going on, but there's a lot more going on than you think. And we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of that tonight. One of my favorite things to do is to share these amazing places and phenomena through television. So Angry Planet is the TV show I'm probably uh, best known for. We did 49 episodes of that TV show. I do a lot of contributing for Science Channel, uh, various other networks. So keep an eye out for me next time you're watching a nature documentary or you might uh, just see a familiar face show up. So, Earth. We all live here, 8 billion of us. There's some really cool facts I'm going to just sort of throw out there right at the very beginning of this presentation. So, how fast are we moving? A lot faster than you might think. We're traveling at 30 kilometers per second. That's over 107 thousand kilometers per hour. And to put that in perspective, a bullet travels at about 2,700 kilometers an hour. And that's just the speed of Earth going around the sun. Of course, we're simultaneously rotating. We're going around the sun. The sun is just one star in our galaxy. That galaxy is rotating and spinning as well. So we are traveling at tremendous speeds, and you would never know it because we're traveling along with the speed of the planet, of course. So I find that fascinating. And the Earth itself, of course, is a sphere, and the outer layer of that sphere, that crust that we live on, it's about 15 to 20, 20 kilometers thick. And that's not a lot. If you were to shrink the Earth down to the size of an apple, the crust would be as thick as the skin on that apple, and that's it. This thin ribbon of habitable space on our planet. That's it. That's all we've got. I find that fascinating as well. The core of the Earth, if you were to drill down to the center, which we don't have the technology to do, it would be 6,000 degrees Celsius. That's the same temperature as the surface of the sun. Another mind-blowing fact. Basically, we have a tiny sun, if you will, in the center of our planet. There's a lot of heat that's trapped down in there. And we only very rarely get to see a glimpse of it when there's a volcano erupting. And of course, I'll talk more about that later. And again, to put things in perspective, the International Space Station, we think that it's orbiting way, way up in space, but it's a lot closer than you might think. It's only 408 kilometers above the Earth. That's the same distance from Toronto to Ottawa, about a four and a half hour drive. If you were to take a globe and just measure the distance between Ottawa and Toronto and then place it horizontally above that globe, you'd see that it's only a less than a centimeter above that globe. The ISS is orbiting really close and the moon would be 10 meters away. So I'm just trying to put some perspective on our place in the planet and also in our own solar system. Now, it's not just the crust. We, we also have the, the atmosphere that we live in and that's broken up into layers as well. The troposphere is the closest layer to the ground. That's where we live. That's where airplanes fly. That's the air that we breathe. That's where all weather happens, basically, is in that troposphere. Anything above that, and you're getting closer and closer into, into space. When Felix Baumgartner jumped out of that uh, balloon at the edge of space, he was jumping from the stratosphere. So just barely above where all of the weather happens. So we've got layers going down into the Earth. We also have layers going up from the surface up into space. And that part where we live in, literally just the top of the crust, some of that's covered in water, about 71%, of course. And, uh, and then we've got the troposphere. And the rest is uninhabitable to humans, both going up and going down. So let's talk about what's going on in that troposphere, in, in the area where all of our weather happens. Well, one of the most dramatic things that happens are tornadoes. And I started chasing tornadoes back in 1998. And what I have to do in, in order to find these is you have to look at these complex computer models and these weather predictions, sometimes days in advance, to try and predict where you think the conditions are gonna be just right for these 
tornadoes to form and you need certain amounts of moisture in the atmosphere and certain wind patterns. And so I'm always looking for patterns in this raw weather data. And then I have to drive into position to go to where I think the tornado might be. That might take a day. It might take two days to get there. And then if I'm lucky, a storm will fire up. And if I'm really lucky, that storm might produce a tornado, hopefully not hitting any towns or cities. I like it when they touch down out in a field and don't affect anyone or anything. And the storms that produce these tornadoes, they're a special type of storm. We call them supercell storms. And this is a shot of me in Texas standing in front of part of one of these supercell storms. And they call them supercells because, well, it makes sense. They are super. They're massive. They can be twice the height of Mount Everest. And the entire storm is spinning. So what happens is the sun heats the ground, the ground then heats the air. So on a hot day, what you're feeling is that the, that hot air is actually mostly the sun heating the ground. That ground heats the air, that hot air wants to rise up. And as it rises up, it goes up higher into the atmosphere and it cools down, forms clouds. And if you have winds traveling in different directions, that rising air can then spin if the wind direction is just right. And if that storm starts to spin, we get this supercell storm. And here's like a cross section of what that might look like. And that photograph of me standing in front of it is down near the bottom where it says gust front. That's the front leading edge of the storm as it's sort of coming towards you. And the tornado would be behind that if there is a tornado. Usually only about 10% of storms are supercells and only about 10% of those supercells produce tornadoes. So they're quite rare. But where do they happen? Well, the United States gets about 75% of the world's total tornadoes. And we have what's called Tornado Alley. It's this, this area in the central part of the uh, continent from central Texas up through Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, up into the Dakotas. But what about Canada? Well. Canada gets a fraction of the number of tornadoes that the United States gets, but we're number two. The US gets between 800 to 1200 tornadoes every year, and Canada gets much less than that, and we'll talk about that in a second, but I wanna show where these tornadoes happen in Canada. Generally, we've got two areas. We've got the Prairie Provinces, and that's the Northern extension of, the, uh, of Tornado Alley, if you will. And it's funny because tornadoes in the United States, typically they happen March, April, May into June. And then later in the year, as the jet stream, those high altitude winds that are going at tremendous speeds, like a high altitude river of wind, it moves further north in the summer into July and August. And that brings a lot of atmospheric energy with it. And that's when we experience our tornadoes up here in Canada. The second place where we get a lot of tornadoes is Southern Ontario. And that has a lot to do with the lakes, the Great Lakes. Because as that rising and warm air in from the Great Lakes, and they converge together and you get these storms that pop up. So those are two like Canadian tornado alleys. And tornadoes are ranked by how strong they are from zero all the way up to five. And Canada only has one documented confirmed F5 tornado, and that's in Eli, Manitoba. Now there's an interesting thing. I was talking about how, um, how Canada gets fewer tornadoes than the US. We used to think that we get 60 or 70 a year, but there's a new project that's been running for a couple of years called the Northern Tornadoes Project. It's a, a project that's part of a Western University. Dr. David Sills, who's a friend of mine, is the executive director. And they've discovered that Canada actually gets closer to 150 tornadoes a year. The problem is Canada is so big and so vast and parts of it are so uninhabited that these tornadoes happen and we never even see them. They have to go in after the fact and, and, and find these damaged paths through the forest up in Northern Ontario and these parts of Northern Saskatchewan and, and such. And so we're really, only recently discovering how many of these there actually are. And when you see these things up close, I've, I've witnessed over a hundred now over years, I actually stopped counting at about a hundred. 
Uh, they can be quite dramatic to me. When you're up close, they sound like a waterfall. And what you're seeing in this picture is the white funnel cloud. So that's what's extending down from the bottom of that supercell storm. And the, the brown that you're seeing is the dirt that's being sucked up by the tornado and thrown around. If you're looking at a tornado with the sun behind you, it'll appear white. But if the storm has the sun behind it, the tornado will appear black. So that's an interesting thing. They will change color depending upon where the sun is in relation to you and the tornado. So I find that quite fascinating as well. And here's a little safety tip. If you see a tornado on the horizon and it's not moving to the left and it's not moving to the right, it just looks like it's getting bigger. That means it's coming straight towards you. And the safest thing to do in a tornado is to get inside a building, get underground in a basement if you have one. If you have no basement, get into an interior room, maybe a bathroom, climb inside the tub. That's the safest place to be during a tornado. I've got a little video clip coming here to show you what it's like to chase one of these things. I'll let it rip right now. This is from South Dakota a few years ago. And I was guiding a group of people on a tornado chasing trip where I would and bring them with me on some of these tornado chases. And here we can see the tornado moving from left to right. So I know it's not coming towards me. I know it's going to cross the road that I'm driving on at some point. So now I've gotten back in the car and we're driving towards the spot where we're trying to predict it's going to cross the road. And there aren't a lot of roads in this part of the world, so we got quite lucky. Here it is, you see it moving left to right, so we're in a very safe spot here. And it's going to pass just behind this building. But watch the oncoming traffic in, in a second here. <laughs> right now all my maps are being sucked out the window because the winds are so strong. But watch, as just as it's about to cross the road, there's a car coming the other direction. And this thing almost runs right into the tornado. It's like, come on, guy, pay attention. I've seen some distracted drivers before, but that that's <laughs> that takes the cake. Sometimes these tornadoes can be absolutely massive, ugly, destructive forces. This photo here, it's hard to tell that this is an actual tornado. If you look at the left, you see a little bit of light. If you look at the right, you'll see a little bit of light. Everything in between is tornado. This is the Guinness World Record largest tornado that anyone has ever seen. And I was there to, to, to witness this. It was in El Reno, Oklahoma back in 2013. And to give you an idea how big this thing was, it was 4.2 kilometers wide. That's 2.6 miles. This thing was absolutely massive. And it just like looked like a smudge on the landscape. So sometimes they have that beautiful rope or snake-like appearance, but sometimes they can be just these gray, dangerous blobs that uh, you have to be very careful about, especially because they can sometimes get wrapped up in rain. And if you can't see the tornado because it's surrounded by rain, then it's extremely dangerous. And just recently, the United Nations uh, released a, a landmark report about uh, climate change and how we have to really uh, get working to, uh, to basically reverse the effects of climate change that we've already uh, been doing for over 100 years now. And one really interesting thing about tornadoes and climate change is that we think there's been some research done. It looks like over the past 40 years or so, Tornado Alley might be moving further east. And that's a concern because as we're getting fewer tornadoes in places like Texas and Oklahoma, we're seeing more tornadoes east of the Mississippi River. And that includes parts of Canada as well. So the, the concern that I have here is that these areas, if you look at a map at night, there's a lot more cities the further east you go in North America, both in the U.S. and Canada. So if we're going to be getting more and more tornadoes further and further east, that puts a lot more people and more property in jeopardy. So there's something that we need to uh, take into consideration moving forward. 
Now, hurricanes are much, much larger than tornadoes. They are massive storms. They can be 800 kilometers wide, and you can't really chase a hurricane. Whenever I'm documenting them, I just have to put myself in the path of the storm and let it overtake me. And uh, yes, hurricanes have that calm eye in the center, and I've been in the eye of numerous hurricanes, and it goes from incredible winds to flat calm, and then a little bit later on, the wind starts screaming again, but in the other direction. And I've got a little video clip here to show you, and it's from Hurricane Katrina, which was probably the most destructive storm that I've ever been in. This thing was, uh, it was a full sensory experience. The sounds, the sights, the smells of the, of the seawater and broken gas lines, it was just unbelievable. And here's what it was like to be in the middle of Hurricane Katrina. The day started off with the winds increasing. My team and I are in a steel reinforced concrete parking garage because it was like a bunker. And pretty soon pieces of roofs were flying through the air. And over a series of hours, the winds just got stronger and stronger and stronger. And Every little piece of gravel flying through the air felt like a, almost like a bullet hitting you in the face. Some of the debris would be lifted up and spun in circles like the blades of a helicopter. And you do not want to be anywhere near that. And at the height of the storm, the winds were around 200 kilometers an hour or so. So this is double highway speed. So imagine driving on the highway at double the speed limit in the rain with your face out the window. That's what it felt like to be in these conditions for hours. And the most destructive part of a hurricane is not even the wind, it's the storm surge. And storm surge is a lump of seawater that those winds push inland, like a flood, like it's almost like a tsunami. And that water rushes inland and damages everything that it hits. And in the case of Hurricane Katrina, the uh, seawater level rose by 10 meters above normal high tide. So we're talking just a wall of water. Absolute destruction. And of course, we could only get tiny glimpses of it because you couldn't drive around in this. It was just too far too dangerous. As a matter of fact, even just walking around inside the parking garage where we were located was difficult because the winds were so strong that we didn't want to get blown away. So I've got safety equipment on, eye protection, helmet, uh, bright colored, colored clothing so we can see each other. And I'm usually with a team of four to six people. And afterwards, it was just a complete mess of destruction. Buildings destroyed, uh, there was a bank that had been lifted, or uh, the entire building of the bank was washed away and just lifted and carried away by the floodwaters. And the only thing that remained was the bank vault. The whole rest of the building was gone. So those typically happen in the summer and we do get hurricanes in Canada. We get quite a few, especially in places like Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Um, but as Canadians, well, we're more familiar with winter weather. That's sort of our jam, if you will, because that's sort of the dominant uh, bad weather that we see more frequently than anything else. And in Canada, particularly in Eastern Canada, or, or in Ontario more specifically, we get a very specific type of winter weather. We get lake effect snow. And it's a unique type of weather phenomena that is an interaction between the water and the atmosphere, that troposphere that we were talking about earlier. So during the summer, if you've ever been swimming in a lake, in Canada, and I'm sure many of you have been swimming in, in a lake in somewhere in the world. In April or May, the water is freezing cold. But if you go in September, the water is much warmer. And that's because it's had the chance to warm up throughout the entire summer. Now winter comes along, the lake is still warm, and now you get cold air pushing it over top as winter starts encroaching. And that cold air going over top of the warm water pulls moisture out of the water. And now that, that moist air converts all that moisture to snow and dumps it 
sometimes dozens or sometimes hundreds of kilometers away from the lake. And that's lake effect snow. And that is a very common thing here around all the Great Lakes, especially if you're downwind. That's where you're going to be getting uh, this lake effect snow. I live in Toronto, so I'm north of Lake Ontario. So we're lucky. We don't get a lot of lake effect snow here. But if you go to places like Barrie, Collingwood, Fort Erie, Buffalo, New York, these are places, the snow belts that we call them, they get just inundated with crazy amounts of lake effect snow that can completely incapacitate entire communities. Sometimes 50 centimeters of snow, sometimes 100 centimeters of snow. It gets absolutely crazy sometimes when these lake effect snow events happen over a series of days. And that's exactly what happened at Christmas time of 2022, just recently. We had this massive lake effect snow event that completely paralyzed Buffalo, New York, pretty much did the same thing to Fort Erie, dumping tremendous amounts of snow. Roads were blocked, trees came down, and it was just, it was a, a disaster was declared. It was that bad. Power was out and freezing, freezing cold temperatures. Now, interestingly, what happens here, as I mentioned, you get that cold air going over top of that warm water. The clouds form, they go further inland, dumps all that snow, usually in one or two particular spots. You can be driving down the highway in beautiful conditions, and then suddenly in a matter of minutes, go from blue sky to complete whiteout. So they're very dangerous when it comes to driving, that's for sure. Driving is the most dangerous part of lake effect snow. And from that particular event, we can see these tremendous bands of lake effect uh, snow, these lines coming off of the lakes. This is a visual satellite image. Now this particular storm was so intense that the winds were so strong that something really interesting happened. I happen to know a lot of the best places to go along the Great Lakes, where to find certain weather events when the wind is blowing from certain directions. So I went to this small town. This was uh, Crystal Beach on the shore of Lake Erie. And the winds from this event were so strong that I knew they were going to produce a lot of lake effect snow, but also the waves were crashing against the shore to such an extent that they were splashing up against the houses. And it was so cold that that water instantly froze. And there were this entire neighborhood that was completely encrusted in a thick layer of ice that had splashed up from Lake Erie. And I was the first person out here. I was the only, there were, <laughs> my footprints, footprints were the only ones in the snow here when I got these photos. And uh, it just, it was surreal. These houses got turned into these abstract uh, sculptures of art. And uh, I can't imagine how long it took to, for these to eventually melt and, uh, and how much that weighed, but it was just something to behold. So let's go from cold to hot, to really hot. Let's talk a bit about volcanoes. And these are the only places, or the only events rather, where the earth can be destructive, but also creative, right? Of, uh, an erupting volcano can be dangerous, of course. It can destroy towns with these massive explosions and ash clouds and such. But it's also how the earth creates itself. New islands are being formed. When lava pours into the ocean in Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii is getting bigger and bigger. So it's a force of creation, but also destruction. And I like that uh, duality of volcanoes. This particular one is on the island of Ambram in Vanuatu. It's in the South Pacific, right between Australia and Fiji. And I've done five or six expeditions here. And this particular volcano is one of the rare ones in the world because it has a lake of boiling lava at the bottom. It's very rare. There's only maybe seven or eight in the entire world. And we would spend weeks camped out at the top of this particular volcano. It's very hard to get to. We would have to bring tons of equipment up with us, drinking water, generators, special tents, supplies, and with the mission of going down inside the crater, down to the very bottom, to try and get as close to the lava as possible. And sometimes I would bring TV cameras, uh, we brought an IMAX camera there one time. Uh, I've worked with scientists gathering samples of lava from the very bottom of this pit and studying the gases. So sometimes it's for television, sometimes it's for science. 
And getting to the top, sometimes you have to fly in with a helicopter. Sometimes you have to hike up depending upon the weather. And you get these clouds at night. And these clouds are full of toxic sulfur dioxide gas. That's the gas that's dissolved in this lava. And all that gas, even though it's not good for you, um, it's quite beautiful. It gets lit by the lava from underneath. And it's just, it's like being on another planet, especially at night. All of our tents get lit up in the fog by this orange glow. And you feel like you're on the surface of Mars. It really is like no other place on Earth. And I absolutely love it. But it's so hostile. Nothing lives up there. There's almost no life. Our tents, we had to put special covers on them because as it rains, the rain passes through these clouds of toxic gas and turns into sulfur, um, um, uh, sulfur, uh, sulfuric acid is the word I'm looking for. So it rains sulfuric acid, very strong sulfuric acid with a pH of one. So like battery acid strong. So we have to protect everything. Any metal gets corroded very quickly. So it's, it's a harsh, harsh environment. So there I am with my gas mask. I'm on the ropes. I'm getting ready to drop down inside the crater. And to give you an idea of how big this crater is, here's a shot looking at our base camp, the yellow and white dots up in the top left corner. And then you've got a sheer cliff that drops straight down for 400 meters down to where the lava is. You can't see the lava in the picture, but you can see the gas. That's the sulfur dioxide gas coming off the lava. And to give you an idea of the sense of scale, this is the same height as the ob observation lounge at the CN Tower. So imagine going to the CN Tower in Toronto, where the restaurant is, that section, cutting a hole in the window, throwing a rope out, and then getting on that rope and rappelling down to the street below. But instead of a street, it's a boiling pool of lava. So that's our mission. I've actually been to the bottom of this volcano 11 times now over the years on, on many different expeditions. And this is from about 100 meters down, that, that ledge. And getting down to the bottom, well, it takes a long time. It takes about an hour and a half of rappelling. It's very difficult, very technical work uh, to get down there. But when you're at the bottom, it is just unbelievable. Yes, that's me, the bottom left. I've got a special heat protective suit that's made of a, a fabric that has aluminum on the outside. It's like a giant oven mitt. <laughs> it uh, helps reflect the heat of the lava away from me. And uh, it helps a certain amount, but uh, you can still feel the heat. Oh, yes, you certainly can. And here's a video of what it looks like to be at the bottom. And there is no visual effects here, no CGI. It's all real. It's also one of the most dangerous and difficult to get to. And to get some of these shots, I had to hide behind some boulders put my camera in record, and then place the camera on top of the rock to film the, the lava because it was just too hot. Just the radiant heat. If you've ever opened your oven and felt that blast of heat that comes out of the oven, imagine that, but much, much worse. And there I am at the bottom. So the, the lava lake is about 60 meters wide, and uh, it is just boiling away like crazy. So you want to minimize the amount of time you spend in a place like that. Uh, normally we would drop down, stay down there for maybe a couple of hours and then ascend back up. And uh, yeah, a lot of protective safety equipment is required, gas mask, the heat protective suit. Without the suit, I could stand in that spot for maybe 10 seconds. With the suit, I could stand there maybe for a few minutes, maybe three, four minutes, something like that. And that's what happened to my camera. <laughs> it was so hot that it was literally melting the plastic on the camera. So this gives you an idea of how, how difficult and uh, dangerous this particular location really, really is. And from here, you can see that the, the lava lake is churning away. It's splashing these fountains of lava way above my head. You have to keep an eye out on that because you might have pieces of lava that come flying over towards you. I've got a steel cable connected to my climbing harness. 
in case I were to fall or the rocks were to break away. And there I'm gathering a fresh sample of, uh, of lava that had just landed. It was still hot. And I ended up bringing that back up. We had a, um, a geologist from Denmark with us that was interested in, in uh, some samples. And that's one thing I do a lot of. I work with scientists. I'm not a scientist myself, but I work with a lot of scientists to gather samples from places that are too difficult or too dangerous for them to do themselves. And I have a lot of fun doing that because it's a challenge for me. And I like finding new ways to, uh, to help scientists learn more about the world that we live in and how amazing it is. And sometimes that involves doing things that no one's ever done before. And that, that I really, really like. Now, not all volcanoes have these boiling lakes of lava. Some of them are more explosive. This is also in the nation of Vanuatu, but this is a different island. This is on Tana Island, and this volcano is called Yasser Volcano. And it has been exploding like this every five minutes for the past 800 years that we know of. So it's very, very reliable. And these pieces of hot lava are flying hundreds of meters through the air. And I've had at least, at least one or two instances at this volcano where I've had pieces of lava landing behind me. And when the explosion happens, you have to look up in the air and watch the trajectory of the lava flying through the air. And you have to sort of judge its position and speed so that it doesn't hit you. Your first instinct is to want to turn around and run. <laughs> but if you're running away from it, you can't see what's flying at you. So it seems a bit uh, counterintuitive. And do I get afraid when I'm going to these places? Yeah, absolutely I do. Um, fear is what helps me to stay alive. I do a lot of research. I do a lot of study before I go to these places. That's probably what keeps me the safest is all of that study and research. And then I go with good teammates. We have a lot of great safety equipment and technology that helps to keep me safe. Uh, but ultimately, you don't want to linger in a lot of these places. And here's what this, here's a little video of what this volcano looks like when it's erupting. So that is me on the right. And we have this small eruption. And just when we thought this eruption was, was over, suddenly it has a big one with thousands of chunks of hot rock just flying through the air. Mother Nature's fireworks. Now, <laughs> as soon as we shot this video, we got out of there real fast. It was pretty safe, like we had been watching the volcano for quite some time and we had deemed it to be a safe location. But uh, even then, Mother Nature can throw a lot of curveballs at you. So danger equals proximity times time. So you want to, at least I want to get close, but the longer I stay in those close areas, the more the danger accumulates. So there's one more thing I want to talk about before I uh, use up all my time today. And that's a big expedition that I did it was funded by the National Geographic Society, and it was to a place called Darvaza Turkmenistan. It's uh, sometimes known as the doorway to hell. And Turkmenistan, it's, a, it's one of the former Soviet republics. It's a, a nation in Central Asia. It's north of Iran. And they have a lot of natural gas there. And they were drilling for natural gas one year, and the drilling operation collapsed and formed this gigantic crater. It's about uh, 100 feet deep and 230 feet across. And it was leaking natural gas, methane. Methane is the main component of natural gas. And someone decided to light it on fire at some point, And it's been burning ever since. And that was about 50 years ago, give or take. So it's been burning for decades. And so I wanted to go here and do the first ever real scientific study of this crater looking for bacterial life living inside the crater because there are planets outside of our solar system that have environments that are hot and full of methane gas well this is a crater that's hot and full of methane gas so if we can find anything living even if it's microscopic that could give us clues as to where we might want to look for life on other planets so basically looking for alien life here on earth and so it took two years of planning and preparation to go here and uh, it's absolutely beautiful. There's nothing around. It's just a desert with this pit of burning fire. It looks like something from a science fiction movie. We were camped out for uh, about a week, studying the crater, taking temperature measurements, uh, analyzing it. And then I had to come up with a plan 
to gather samples from the bottom. And that was my big mission. And so what we learned was, is that the heat comes up the sides of the crater and then cooler air drops down in the center. And so the idea would be we would stretch fire resistant ropes across the entire span of the crater. And then I would go out on those ropes wearing my special heat suit and then drop down in the very center. And you can see in the middle of the crater, there's no fire. Just to the right of the big fire, there's a spot where there's no fire. So that was perfect. That was my landing zone. And so we spent several days um, just studying these, um, these heat patterns and such. And then we set up the ropes. We used gigantic bags of sand uh, as anchors to hold my weight. And then we, uh, we had a TV crew with us from, from National Geographic. I'm there on the left with my air tank, so I'm breathing my own air. I'm not uh, worried about breathing any toxic gases that are down there or, or superheated air. I don't want to burn my lungs. Um, and uh, after two years of planning, it became time to uh, step off the edge. And that climbing harness I'm wearing is one of a kind, custom made out of Kevlar, which is the same material they make bulletproof vests out of. And uh, any other regular climbing harness would have melted from the heat. And then out onto the ropes I went on these pulleys, went out to the middle, and then descended down to the very bottom. And I had 17 minutes. That's all the time I had. That's all the air I had. So I had to gather samples. I had to take special measurements with a special temperature probe that I had. As I was digging in the ground, fire started coming out of the hole that I was digging. Because as I would dig to gather soil samples, the gas would find new ways to get to the surface, and then it would ignite. So it was just, just bizarre and kind of quite beautiful, actually, being there at the bottom, surrounded by flames. And uh, 12 people have stood on the surface of the earth, but only one person had been to the bottom of the doorway to hell. So it was a very special moment for me. Uh, I got a Guinness World Record for being the first person to set foot down here. And if you can't see me in this picture, it's kind of a bit like a Where's Waldo. Look just to the right of the big flame. Let me zoom in. There I am, tethered in with my rope, and I'm gathering some, some rock samples uh, there. Quite stunning. And yes, we found life down there. We found several different types of uh, bacteria and archaea, which are a type of similar to a bacteria that are thriving in these crazy hot conditions full of methane gas. And some of them are even consuming some of that methane gas. We know that plants can convert sunlight to energy. That's photosynthesis. But there are certain organisms, microscopic or organisms, that do something called chemosynthesis. So they can convert uh, chemical compounds into energy. And that's what some of these uh, microbes are doing here in the crater. They're converting methane gas into energy. So that's really interesting. It's very rare. It's found in certain bacteria living at the bottom of the ocean at deep sea uh, volcanic vents in some places like um, hot springs and things like that. So really weird, weird life forms. So hopefully this information may lead to the discovery of life on other planets. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but it was nice to be able to uh, contribute to this, this type of knowledge. And let me tell you, the best feeling in the world is when your teammates hoist you up and out of the crater and you finally set foot back on solid land, safe and sound. And over 25 years going to all of these different places, having a lot of close calls, I'm very proud to say, not a single broken bone, not a single overnight stay in hospital. Um, I try to do dangerous things in as safe a manner as possible. And I'm pleased to report that there's been no, you know, no major injuries. And, and so that's a, a something, that's a record that I plan on continuing for the rest of my career as well. So yeah, so I'm hoping that maybe I got you inspired a little bit to maybe learn about some interesting natural phenomena. I really, we, we had the chance to dip our toe into this, uh, into this subject. If you want to see more, you can always hop over to my website or hit me up on social media. 
there's uh, lots of different ways to see what I'm doing out there. Um, here's a little little tip, please. The next time maybe you've got uh, a storm that's in your neighborhood, uh, watch the sky. The sky can tell us so much. We spend so much time looking in our in our screens and looking down at the ground. There's a lot to be learned particularly here in Canada, because we get so many different amazing natural phenomena. Some are dangerous, some are beautiful, some are both, but all of them are fascinating. And I want to thank you so much for allowing me to share some of these stories with you today. And uh, be safe out there. Well, thank you so much, George, for sharing your adventures and expertise with us today. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating talk. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, if you have a few minutes, would you be willing to answer a couple of questions? Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Um, so I know what brought me to the study of geography was really two things, kind of a fascination for those natural phenomena, the, the volcanoes, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, uh, the restless earth that, that you talked about today. Um, the second was really the stories of those explorers that filled in the blanks on the map. Uh, you know, both on paper, but also in our imaginations. Um, my path led me to the classroom, obviously. Yours took you in a very different direction. I, I wonder if you could share with us what that that one spark was that led you to this life as a storm chaser and as an explorer. Yeah, it was a bit of a convoluted path, but there's, there's definitely a, a, an arc here. And when I was in high school, or let me go back a little bit further. When I was a kid growing up, I grew up in uh, in Gatineau, Quebec, so I had easy access for me to get there. Spent a lot of time out in nature, so I always had an interest in science and nature as a kid. In high school, my two favorite subjects were music and geography. Peter McLeod was my geography teacher, and he had a tremendous influence on me. So, and I started working in recording studios, doing music, and then sound for film and television. So I learned a lot about how television worked. And then in my spare time, I would take my vacation days and I started to go and chase storms. And my knowledge about television from working in these recording studios allowed me to uh, get both behind the camera and in front of the camera and gave me more opportunities to do more and more and more and more. And I kept getting interviewed by news agencies and newspapers. And then one day, I got a phone call from a TV producer, Peter Rowe. And he said, I read about you in the newspaper. You've got an interesting life. Let's make a TV show about it. And then I had to quit my job and uh, as an engineer and then start doing this full time. So at the time, it seemed a bit convoluted. But looking backwards at my life through my adult to high school to early childhood, it all makes sense. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny where, where life does take us. I think that's, you know, uh, maybe a lesson for, for any of the young people that are, are watching this is that, uh, you know, you never know where life is going to take you. And uh, it could take you to the bottom of a, an erupting volcano, uh, depending <laughs> on your, uh, you know, depending on your situation. So uh, thanks. Um, now, we saw you in some pretty dicey situations uh, in some of the pictures and, and some of the videos. Um, out of all of these risky experiences, was there ever a time where you felt you were, were most in danger? Maybe where you're saying to yourself, what the heck am I really doing here? Yeah, I've done a lot of, I've been swimming with piranhas. Climbing mountains in North Korea. I, I've been flying in helicopters over uh, rebel-controlled territory in eastern Congo. So there's there's danger that comes from a lot of places that you might not think. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's the weather. Sometimes it's the environment. Sometimes it's sometimes it's things you can't even see. I was in a cave in Kenya, a place called Kidum Cave. We were filming an episode of Angry Planet, and this cave is famous because it's the only place in the world where herds of elephants go deep inside the cave, 100 meters in, and they scrape the cave walls with their tusks and they chew the rocks to get minerals in their diet. So we wanted to try and document this really bizarre, unique behavior. 
But the problem is, is this cave was also the center for two outbreaks of a disease called Marburg hemorrhagic fever. And it's related to Ebola, very similar. So if you catch this disease, basically what happens is your internal organs start to liquefy and you bleed out of every hole in your body. And it's a horrible way to die. So, <laughs> so I went there <laughs> and we know that the bats are somehow related to this virus, this Marburg virus. And so in the cave, I had the world's leading bat biologist who had mapped this cave, the best person in the world to have with me. So I had a really good team. I had special protective clothing, Tyvek coveralls, surgical gloves, respirator, eye protection, helmet. And we're going towards the back of the cave and you can see the scrape marks from the elephants. And the bats are at the back and my cameraman turns on his light and all the bats come out, they're streaming towards us. And I managed to catch one and I want to show it to the camera so that we can get a close up. And the bat is a mama carrying a baby. These are Egyptian fruit bats. She bites through my glove oh. and into my thumb. And now I don't know if I've got a week left to live, if I'm literally the walking dead. And so it wasn't like a bolt of lightning where it's frightening and dangerous for a few milliseconds or a tornado where it might be for a few minutes or a hurricane where it's a few hours. This was almost an entire week of not knowing if my insides were going to turn to jello. And that was pretty frightening. It's sometimes it's the things you can't even see that are the most terrifying. Oh, absolutely. And thanks for sharing that story. Um, I, ca I can't imagine sort of the anxiety uh, that, that would be there until you, uh, you finally get your, your, all your tests back. So, uh, wow. Um, last question. Short one. What's next on the bucket list? Oh, so interestingly, uh, you may have seen uh, in the news recently, there was an expedition that went down to um, Saunders Island near Antarctica. Right. And there's a volcano there called Mount Michael. Right. And it had never been climbed before. And I've known about this place for a long time. And a few years ago, satellite imagery told us that there was likely a lake of lava inside the bottom of this volcano. But no one had ever seen it. So that was number one on my bucket list for quite some time. And then just the other day, I learned that a team recently had gone there, climbed the volcano, they were the first to ever get to the top, and they saw the lake of lava, but they only saw it using drones. So still, no human has ever laid eyes on the lava inside that volcano, and certainly no one has ever been inside and down to the bottom. So that is something that I would really like to accomplish. Uh, as a world's first, and there's a lot to learn because no samples have ever been taken from this place. We don't know the chemical composition of this lava. There's there's so many questions. And uh, now we've got at least one expedition that has gone, they've gone so far, but they haven't gone all the way. And that's, <laughs> that's like a beacon to me. That's the, uh, that's certainly very worthy of the bucket list. And uh, we look forward to seeing the footage when you finally get there. I, I have every confidence that you'll make it. So uh, that's fantastic. George, on, on behalf of Canadian Geographic Education, the RCGS, and all of our viewers for GeoNight, uh, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, we wish you all the best. We look forward to the hearing the stories of your next adventures, um, and, and we wish you well. The pleasure is 100% mine. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you. Cheers.